Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and managed by LiveChamp. So this is Shen Chu. I will be the moderator for this session that is titled Understanding Cash Flow Management, the heartbeat of every business. So uh, do you agree that cash is king? Okay, if yes, maybe you type Y lah in the comment box so we know. You see, cash flow is the bloodline of every business and it's very important for us to get a very healthy operation cash flow so that you know we can grow the business because a business can only grow as far as the cash flow allows. So today, we are going to study deeply into cash flow management. So uh, before we begin, as usual, disclaimer. So whatever we share on this webinar is only for educational purpose. So in no way that we give any recommendation to buy or sell any companies in this uh, webinar. Whatever case study that we present in this webinar is only for educational purpose. So if you decide to make any investment decisions, uh, you're 100% responsible for all your investment uh, risks, okay? So allow me to briefly introduce our speaker today, and he is none other than David Paul. Now, David is the founder of Spiral Thinker Group, Sindhya Bahad. An engineer by training, David began his career as an engineer in the telco industry for 10 years before turning to his passion in value investing. So uh, David is now a full-time investor and dedicates his time and resources to nurture the youth in financial literacy. He is often invited to speak in uh, brokers' webinars, seminars, as well as other Bursa and DOS events, and his professional comments and opinions on value investing are often featured in business publications like Focus Malaysia. So David also provides consultation services in value investing and advanced portfolio strategies for high net worth individuals. So David, it's an honor to have you here in the webinar today. Hi, good evening, Shane. Thanks for uh, having me again. It's nice to be back. Can you hear me yeah. properly? <laughs> All right, so let me hand over the session to you. All right. I think, hope, hope you guys can hear me loud and clear. All right. Uh, well, once again, Thanks a lot uh, to Shane and LiveChamp as well as Busa Malaysia for organizing all these educational uh, um, webinars for everyone to uh, learn, you know, in this uh, uh, pandemic era. So um, if, 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 you are, if, you're not, if you are not new to LiveChamp, um, I'm sure that perhaps uh, you guys would have seen or heard some of my um, webinars before, you know, and I've been... Uh, most of the time, I talk about technology, uh, businesses, and stocks, as well as portfolio management. But tonight, I would like to go back to the uh, bit more basics, right? Uh, back to how to analyze financial statements. But not just any financial statements. Um, in fact, I just want to look at the most important financial statements of all, which is the cash flow statements. And that's why we, we term it as every business's heartbeat, all right? Now, um, it is very important, like what uh, Shane has mentioned, actually, not just for business. In fact, on the individual level, knowing how to manage your cash flow is of absolute importance as well. Hopefully, through my sharing tonight, uh, we can give you, I can, I can impart to you some sort of um, insights of how good companies uh, manage their cash flows and how we can learn from them, as well as uh, how not so good companies uh, are botched on their cash flow management and how we can avoid mistakes like theirs. All right. So as usual, um, my uh, our seminars, sorry, our, our sessions are usually split to a few topics. So tonight, I'm going to start with the importance of cash flows and a quick introduction. Then I'm going to move on to talk about the three cash flow statements at a very high level uh, uh, um, uh, angle. Then uh, I'm going to dive into the working capital management, some, some, which is something not many people talk about. Um, in fact, even uh, during analyst briefing and fund managers briefing with public listed companies, I noticed that not a lot of people uh, talk about working capital management. And tonight, I'm going to share with you guys why this is absolutely important. Okay. And last but not least, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end with a couple of case studies, very interesting ones. So make sure that you stay uh, until the end. Yeah. Now I know that to some of you, we have about we have slightly more than three hundred um, uh, participants tonight. Okay. Uh, it's very far cry from the other technology related uh, sessions. Yeah, Shane. But I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. All right. In fact. Um, although this is a dry topic, all right, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Okay, without much further ado, let me try to do this first. All right. 
Okay, let's start with the importance of cash flow. Okay, now just to recap, uh, I think a sometime back in April, uh, when we when I started off with the first topic under the Islamic capital management, sorry, Islamic capital, uh, Malaysia market, uh, series, I talk about sustainable investing, right? And here I presented the first time for the first time I presented our model of looking uh, how we look at companies and and if you remember I stress a lot on quality uh, compared to quanti uh, quantitative analysis now. But this topic, we're going to look at the quantitative aspect, uh, which is actually the value. Now, under the value aspect, we've got the aspects of uh, measuring the performance of a business, uh, how, how strong it is in terms of balance sheet. So the performance, we measure it through P&L, uh, profit and loss account, uh, the strength through balance sheet. And last but not least, is actually the cash flow statement is where we look at how efficient is the management of this business. Yeah. Okay. And of course, um, as, as I mentioned before, um, this although tonight is really about uh, cash flow management of a business, right? In fact, you can learn a lot from how these uh, uh, great companies uh, 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 manage their cash flow and how we can emulate that in our daily lives. But of course, um, this is a very interesting game. I have it. Uh, I have one set on my own as well. It's a uh, it's a great uh, a, a way to spend your time with your family, with your kids, right? As well as to impart to them the knowledge uh, of how to manage your own cash flow. It's a very fun game, yeah. But don't hear it from me. Hear it from successful people like Mr. Tony Fernandez here. Now, although yes, Asia is going through a very rough patch. In fact, I think it's the um, if it's the most challenging time in the history of Asia, right? But but notwithstanding the pandemic, which has brought Asia business down, right? But this is a great business and, and, and the way uh, the founders as well as the board of directors manage business is of absolute, um, um, you know, I really have high respect for them. Now we met uh, over um, with, at Spiral Thinker uh, along with our members as well, along as our students. We met Tan Sri Tony Fernandez at the Red QKI 2 back in 2019, you know, in April, exactly about, 11 months before the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, at that time, who ever known, right? Who would have a guess, right? There, there'll be a, a, a tiny little virus that will actually rock the whole, uh, 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 wreck the whole world, isn't it? Yeah. But, but uh, one of the key takeaways from that day, right, at uh, Red Q, actually, uh, Tony Fernandez mentioned this, right? And I'm going to quote him here, uh, uh, verbatim, yeah. He said that I am a cash person, you know? He said, I'm not in this business for the PL. I'm in a business for cash flow. And likely so. If you study the AASIA's cash flow statements, right, of the PL uh, before the pandemic, you notice that AASIA, this business is a cash cow. Uh, before the pandemic hit, I remember they are doing it, uh, they, are, they, are, they are booking a um, cash flow for operations, meaning the cash which is generated from the operation, business operations, they, I think they are doing more than 2 billion ringgit a year. Now, imagine if you are a business owner whereby your business bring in cash. Now, I'm talking about real cash, not just, you know, accounting profit, you know, it's real cash coming in net huh, of 2 billion, you are 2 billion ringgit. You can do a lot of things with this so, so much money, right? You can invest, you can uh, expand on business and so forth. And that is why tonight I want to talk about the importance of uh, cash flow, right? So let's go straight towards the three important cash flow statements. Now, as you know, um, uh, if if you are if 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 you are already investor right, or you just if you just started investing, I'm sure you heard of these three financial statements. The most, uh, I think, the most popular one is the profit and loss, or what we call P and L. I think these days they call it a income statement. All right, and then we've got the balance sheet, uh, in, a statement of uh, financial position or something like that, as well as the cash flow. Now, if you if you are privy or you read a lot of um, these uh, analyst reports or uh, uh, news articles, you will notice that they focus a lot on PL and balance sheet, and not a lot of people focus on cash flow statement. All right. Now, PL, of course, everybody knows about sales, everybody knows about net profit, uh, balance sheet, everybody knows about how much debt a company carries, how much assets they have, so on and so forth. But, but I can tell you a lot of people or even a lot of analysts or even investors, they don't, do not really focus on cash flow. But why is cash flow so important? Now, in our opinion, right? Um, all, all three statements are important, but they 
each of them play a different role, show a different angle or side of the business. Give you an example. The profit and loss shows how a business is performing. Now, when we say a business is performing, normally we say, yeah, the sales grow by how much per annum, you know, and then their, their profit grow by how much. This, this is how we measure uh, the performance of any business. Now, the balance sheet tells us the condition of a business, whether they are healthy or they are distressed or they are being managed uh, uh, properly. And we can see a lot of these uh, from uh, the construct of the balance sheet, how much assets they have, how they weigh it against the liabilities, and uh, what, what are their equity, uh, what are the shareholders uh, are getting for the business in terms of ROE, uh, what are they getting from the invested capital, so on and so forth. And this we can get on the balance sheet. On the other hand, the cash flow is actually the heartbeat, the blood flow of the business. Now, you think about it. If you are a businessman, sorry, I should say, I'm sure a lot of our listeners tonight, all right, are businessmen uh, on his or her own right. You may have a big, you have, may have your own small uh, business or you have a, you're managing a big business or you are a uh, manager in a business or a family business, you know. Now, let me ask you, what would be your major concern if say you own a big business, you own any business today, all right? Let's say you own a restaurant during the pandemic. What would you be worried at? Would you be worried at how much profit or loss you make that year? Or would you be worried about, do I have enough cash in my bank? Do I have enough cash coming into my business against cash that I had to pay? The money that I had to pay, physical money that I had to pay, you know, your, your, your our, uh, utilities, um, uh, salaries, uh, rental, uh, suppliers, so on and so forth. I would say that um, the pandemic, right, uh, although it's very devastating, but it really does, um, I would say, reset the entire business landscape. Uh, it exposes a lot of business that are, you know, weak, and it also uh, makes uh, good businesses even stronger after, uh, when the pandemic is over, yeah? So back to the cash flow statements, there are a three uh, different cash flow statements are not just one. So we first of all, we have the cash flow uh, from operating activities, uh, followed by investing activities cash flow, and last but not least, financing. So I'm going to talk about these three uh, 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 in detail now. Um, not too much detail, but to give you a basic understanding. But before that, I want to uh, highlight here that, you know, um, please do not understand, uh, sorry, please do not assume that cash flow is the only important metric when you analyze business. That is not what I'm trying to say. Um, in fact, cash flow just gives us an angle, uh, the angle of how a business, how efficient a business is being run. And I want to, uh, I want to uh, highlight here that cash flow is not profit, is uh, not profit at all, but and uh, profit is not everything as well. Now, a lot of people focus too much on profit. And it is also not right to focus only on cash flow. It has to be a balancing act, okay? Now, what's cash flow statement? Cash flow statement is a real cash transaction for any sort of inflow and outflow for the following activities, all right? So, so uh, before we look at the activities, uh, just uh, maybe uh, to clarify on the inflow and outflow, right? So imagine you are a business, cash coming into your business is a positive transaction because cash is coming in. Cash that you pay out of the business, all right, for your expenses is an outflow. So in terms of uh, um, the uh, mathematical operations, arithmetics is a negative transaction, all right? So whatever is presented here is a net figure of the inflow and the outflow. Okay, give you an example. Under operating activities, right, is it, it is any type of transaction that requires cash uh, relate, which is related to your profit making or what we call economic activities. I'll give you an example. If you are a business that sells computers, all right, every time you sell, uh, every time you sell a computer, cash is coming in from this sale. So it is a positive transaction from the business. Every time you buy the, your, your materials from your suppliers, right? It is uh, things are coming in, but cash is going out from your business. So these are cash for cash outflow related to your operating activities. But you may be asking, are all cash transactions related to our, uh, the business's economic activities? Not necessarily. 
For example, back to the example of a um, the computer business. Say you buy suddenly you buy a land you know, because you have got so much money, right? You don't know where to spend, okay? And you buy a piece of land, and this land is not related to generating your sales of uh, of your computers or your uh, other devices that you are selling. And this land is purely for investment purposes. So this cash transaction will not be recorded as an operating activities cash flow, but instead an investing activities cash flow. Okay, so uh, investing activities cash flow can be uh, are, can be related to cash transactions that is related to the business. Uh, sorry, which related to the investment activities. Now, investment activities can also be related to the operating activities. For example, if you are a, a manufacturing company, so you, you're manufacturing phones or computers, right? Uh, and you need to expand your factory because business is, is very well, business is very good. Uh, in fact, during the pandemic, your business has um, a boom. So you need more uh, capacity. So you invest in, let's say, the plant next door. You bought, you buy a new uh, factory. You convert the factory to your manufacturing plant. So these are the investment that you are that you are partaking to grow your business. All right, and this is normally what we call capex. Capex stands for capital expenditure. All right. Uh, so this is also part of investing. So when you spend money to grow your business, to, to, to buy, uh, I mean, to, to purchase investments, so, so, so sorry, it can also be financial assets. For example, you can also buy stocks, or okay? you can buy bonds, okay? you can buy any type of financial assets and, or for investments, or this is also called investing activities transaction, right? So every time you pay money out of the business for this investment activity, it is a negative because money is going out of a business. But what you say, you, you, you have an old plant and you say, oh, it's, no more you, uh, uh, it's not useful anymore. It has reached the end of life. I want to sell it. So you found a buyer, right? And you sell this plant, this piece of land, right? So you get money, isn't it? Now let's not talk about the profit first. Let's not talk about the profit that you made from selling this. It's, it's really the cash transaction, right? So whatever money that you received from selling this asset will be considered as inflow of the investment activities. All right, so remember that. So every year, there will be several transactions like these. And at the end of the year or at the end of the reporting period, the cash flow for investing activities will be a net of these transactions related to investing activities. Okay, you guys clear so far? Pretty simple, isn't it? Now, last but not least, it's also a very important uh, activity of cash flow. It's called financing activities. All right, now financing activities cash flow is anything all the any cash transactions that is related to how a business uh, seek its funding sources or how it repay the debts, all right, or even paying dividends or receiving dividends. All these are uh, grouped under financing activities cash flow. For example, back to uh, business, back to the business now where you want to buy a piece of land, right, which is not a operating activities cash flow, but it's a capex. All right, uh, which may or may not be related to your uh, core business. So say you want to buy a piece of land all right, for, for investment, but you don't want to use, may, you may not have enough money, so you, you, you try to get a loan from the bank, right? So if let's say the bank approves you for 1 million uh, ringgit to buy the land, right? So this is, is a 1 million ringgit uh, 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 inflow of cash flow, of, of cash, right? But of course, at the same time, you have to pay uh, maybe you had to pay by installment or whatever that you are uh, you have with the with the vendor, right? So it is the same for other uh, for other assets or other capital sources as well. Now sometimes uh, a listed company they will also they can also raise money from their shareholders or from different other sources like uh, bonds. All right, uh, I'm sure you guys have rights issue, isn't it? Sometimes business. Uh, because they need to expand, they, all, they can actually raise money from the shareholders by uh, offering rights issues. And when, when, when the shareholders take up the rights, they pay the company a certain amount of money in order to attain the rights uh, to buy uh, additional shares of the company. Then the company gets the money, all right, gets the capital to expand or do whatever capital, uh, sorry, working, working uh, capital uh, expenses. Uh, at the same time, they will also offer 
these uh, uh, rights issues holders an additional number of shares based on whatever that they have subscribed to. All right, so these are all the cash transactions uh, uh, um, um, related to financing activities. Now you may be asking, hey David, so cash flow, right? Is positive always better? Is always good? Or does it mean that negative is always bad? Not necessarily, that's the answer. Uh, it depends on the context. For example, um, so whatever they've talked about in this webinar, right? Um, it is applicable for manufacturing for most businesses, except for banks, except for insurance, except for financial institutions institution type of business, all right? And if, at the end of that, right, uh, whatever I'm sharing is actually uh, 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 applicable. Now, let's say uh, you are a trading company or you are a manufacturing company, right? So in for the operating activities, what do you think? Is positive uh, always good or negative? Uh, cash flow is good. Think about it. If you're a manufacturing company or a trading company, now, if, if, if that's the case, right, for operating activities, positive is always better because it shows that your business is generating enough cash flow or, or, or positive cash flow from the business. Now, don't get me wrong. A business can be profitable, meaning they can record a profit, but at the same time, they have a negative operating activities. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. It can happen. All right. But for investing activities, uh, cash flow, whether it's negative or positive, better or otherwise, depends on the context. So you have to look at what is the what makes it so. I'll give you an example. Normally for investing activities, if it's negative, right, it is it shows that the company is in a net net basis that they're spending more for investment compared to uh, selling the assets. Then you ask me, uh, hey, David. Uh, every year this company gets positive investing and dividends cash for good one, right? Because they keep on selling, right? My question to you is, how long or how often do you think they can sell the assets? <laughs> I'll give you a very good example. Uh, the shipping business, as you know, uh, for the longest time, right, they have been uh, in uh, very bad shape because of oversupply of the vessels. It's just that after the COVID, right, suddenly because there are a lack of ships, a lack of shipbuilding, lack of cargoes, right, suddenly, uh, shipping is booming, right? The, the, the shipping rates, the freight rates are actually booming sky high uh, because of lack of uh, these uh, 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 supply, right? So before that, a lot of shipping companies are actually selling their old vessels to generate cash flow to sustain the business. So for many years, you see that a lot of these uh, uh, companies, shipping companies, they're investing in this cash flow will be positive. So then you, may, then you have to think about, is this really healthy? How long can they sustain? Or how long do you think they need to do this before they can turn around? So you go to ask this question. Now, in terms of financing activities, personally, personally, I would prefer to see a negative more than a positive uh, net uh, transaction. The reason is very simple. If a company is always reporting positive financing year in, year out, right, it tells you that this company is always raising money either from borrowing the, from the bank or raising from the shareholders or raising through other financial instruments. Now, again, you ask yourself, is it healthy that they are always borrowing money, <laughs> right? Just like a person, if the person is an individual is always getting more and is, is getting himself or herself more and more debt every year, right? Something is not right, isn't it? This is the same for a business. So uh, for financing activities, I would like to see a net, negative cash flow rather than positive. And the other reason is also uh, companies, when companies pay out cash dividends, it is, it is um, categorized under financing activities cash flow as well. So later on, I'll show you some examples of how uh, some companies manage this, yeah? Now, if you sum up all the operating, investing and financing activities cash flow that's what you get net cash at the end of the of the reporting period for a business so it indicates uh, whether the liquid asset of business uh, increases or decreases in during that financial period don't forget because each of these uh, activities can be positive or negative transaction right so you of course if you if this is positive and this is negative positive um 
a positive number, you add with a negative number, it becomes a minus, isn't it? It, it becomes a deduction. So whatever you you sum you sum up all this here, uh, regardless of the uh, uh, of whether it's a net inflow alpha, right? You get the net cash. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, generally positive cash flow indicates that a company's liquid assets, right, are increasing in quantity. So is that good? Yes, generally, because it tells you that the business can settle its uh, financial obligations. It can reinvest to grow the business and it can even return money or capital to shareholders through dividends or, or you know, any type of corporate exercise. It can also pay the expenses for its operation, all right, as well as provide some sort of buffer against uh, you know, challenges like the COVID-19, right? Now, on the other hand, negative cash flow indicates the company's liquid assets are decreasing. Now, in terms of net cash, of course, um, every year there should be at least some sort of uh, 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 res, uh, sorry, excess, all right? That's where we get positive net cash. But sometimes business do, do report negative net cash. So then it depends on how strong is the balance sheet. But I hope that from here you can see that actually all these three financial statements are interrelated. Uh, they are not, you should not analyze them in silo. Uh, actually, you should look at them in a totality, a big picture. Okay. So that's about the different cash flow. Now let's let's look at what are the examples of uh, operating cash, activities cash flow, investing activities cash flow, and financing uh, activities cash flow. Now, by the way, uh, these um, short forms is just what we use as Spiral Thinker, right? So I mean, in I mean, out of this context, you may see CFFO, which stands for cash flow from, uh, op uh, no CF, cash flow for operating activities, cash flow from financing activities, so on and so forth, right? So there are many ways to look at it, but they mean the same. For for us, we we use operating activities. The activities is a small letter, cash flow. Now, um, under OACF. Uh, whatever receipts in cash from, again, sales of goods and services is a positive transaction. Collection of prepayments that prepaid is also a positive collection. It's a positive transaction. Uh, collection of receivables. Ah, so you see, this is very important because sometimes when we book a sale, uh, for example, you suddenly, let's say back to the computer shop, now suddenly a school or a government agency uh, bought, say, 100 iPads from you. <laughs> So there's a lot of money, right? So sometimes they don't, they won't pay you one lump sum. They may say, um, okay, you 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 send me the goods, you send me your invoice, but give me a you know a a a, a period of time for me to settle the debt, to settle the the to, to pay you the money. So sometimes um, it can be thirty days, it can be three months, <laughs> and sometimes it can drag to more than one year, as you can see later. Yeah. So. Um, you see what happens is when you book the sale, when you deliver your goods, right? In the PL, it is already booked at the sale, and you have to calculate the profit from this transaction already. But in terms of cash flow, you don't get anything yet. Why? Because you only get the cash or part of the cash 30 days later or 15 days later, you know, depending on your, your TNCs or terms and conditions with your uh, customer. So when you are collecting, when the business is collecting money from this receivable, then it is a transaction, it's a positive transaction. So you can see the difference between p and and cash flow now, isn't it? All right. Now, how about outflow? When you, every time you spend money to, 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 to pay for raw materials, every time you spend money to, you know, to pay your, to pay the payroll, or marketing activities, advertising, uh, you know, paying your CEO salary, uh, interest paid to your banks, your creditors, pay income tax, and any other expenses related uh, directly or indirectly to your economic activities. These are all under operating activities cash flow. Okay, so at the end, it is a net. So definitely, in this case, for most businesses under study, we would prefer a positive operating activities cash flow. Okay, now, but don't get too worried if you suddenly see a negative cash operating activities cash flow. Uh, that's why I highlight this to you so that you can go and find out actually what happened. Is it because they, are, they cannot sell their raw material, I mean, their, 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 their goods, or is it because they are stocking up on their inventory? We never know. It could be a good thing, right? Or maybe they cannot collect from the receivables. Uh, that, cannot, that may raise a red flag. Okay, now next, moving on to the investment activity cash flow. Uh, 
for the inflow positive transaction is any you know um, sell of fixed asset or long term assets like your land your 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 buildings all right uh, sell of financial assets sell of uh, machines pp and e uh, referring to property plant and equipment collection of your loans uh, principal the principal portion proceeds from insurance yes uh, if you claim insurance actually these are also uh, cash cash uh, inflow uh, uh, as the investing at is cash flow. Now, cash payments, uh, cash outflow under investing activities, uh, you know, you buy fixed asset, long-term assets, you buy financial assets, you buy machines, you uh, give loans to the parties, all right, these are all cash outflow. So these are negative transactions. Again, net-net, the IICF, the investing activities cash flow will be all the net cash flow related to your non or long term assets, as we call non current assets. Last but not least, the financing and this cash flow. Uh, you know, as I mentioned already, every time you raise money through debt, through equity, through uh, sell treasury shares, especially if uh, if a listed company has amassed quite a huge sum of treasury shares, normally they can raise money by selling the treasury shares to a interested party. Uh, through private placement or selling back into the open market to raise money, they can do that as well. All these are positive transactions. Now, when the company pays the principal of their loans or they repurchase their own shares for the market or they distribute the, some of the earnings through cash dividends, these are all cash outflow under financing activities. And again, if you sum up all these, these are all uh, financing activities cash flow related to non-current liabilities or owner's uh, equity. All right. Okay. So that is what it is. Now, I want to highlight to you actually for these two. If we sum up, if we sum up uh, operating activities cash flow together with investing activities cash flow, we get what we call free cash flow. Now, sometimes an investing activities cash flow can be negative. So it'll be a negative here. And you, if you uh, use take this figure, you plus, you, you, um, you add with a negative figure, so it becomes minus, right? Then it becomes a free cash flow. Now, free cash flow uh, to us is also an important um, a metric. Um, especially if you want to look at how a business has been managed over the long term. Now, ideally, a business should generate free cash flow, uh, more and more free cash flow along the way. Sometimes they may go through a rough patch for a couple of years, it's fine. But if you look at long term basis, it should at least have a net uh, free cash flow over the long term. Now, if it's a negative free cash, if, if they are still generating or net net, they are still uh, having a negative free cash flow over 10, 15, 20 years, right? It's a bad, actually, it's a very big red flag that something is not right about this company or this business. But again, I have to reiterate. These, um, this type of uh, analysis only works for non-financial or non-insurance type of businesses, okay? All right, so I hope you have uh, followed uh, me uh, all up to now, okay? Now, if you have any questions, you can, you can ask about, about it later, all right? So uh, I'm gonna dive into the working capital management next because this is of absolute importance as well. Now, um, and don't take my word for it again, okay? Um, this is a statement by Nestle, uh, Nestle SA, uh, not Nestle Malaysia. This is, this is the uh, headquarter in, uh, in, in, all right. Uh, this is based on the July 2018 edition of Nestle's report on alternative performance measures. You see, Nestle do not really look at PL as well. In fact, the group monitors will average working capital to evaluate how efficient, see, efficiency it is at managing its operating cash conversion cycle. So there are two things here I want, I want you to take note of. One is working capital. And secondly is cash conversion cycle. These two are inter, intricately interrelated to each other. So uh, let's talk about what makes up working capital. So I'm going to show you something visually so that it's easier for you to understand. Okay, now these are all the components that makes up the working capital. For example, the inventory that you have in your business or in your warehouse, this forms your working capital as well. Your cash or your trade receivables or even payables, all right? These are all your current assets. Now, sometimes raw materials also parts form part of inventory. It also forms parts of your uh, working capital asset. Now, on the other hand, 
uh, liabilities, current liabilities. So you notice that these are not long term. These are all the current assets and liabilities, including what you owe for wages, your rental, your utilities, taxes, uh, trade payable, something you have to pay, right? All these, and among other things, form your current li liabilities. Now, if you take current assets, my takeaway, your current liabilities, what you end up is your working capital. Now, uh, working capital, will, and again, includes cash, inventory, or your raw materials, work in progress, uh, your operating expenses, your trade receipts and payable, short-term debt, so on and so forth. These form your working capital. And working capital is what a business need uh, require in terms of uh, cash or capital for them to run the business operations day in, day out. Okay, that's why working capital management is very important. Then you may, you may, some of you, uh, uh, I mean, logically speaking, right? Working capital, then of course, the bigger the number, the better. Is that true? Not necessarily. Because sometimes you have to look at it in context. For example, sometimes when inventory can be too much or you can have too much cash on hand, which means that yes, although it's safe, but maybe you're not really sweating your assets to generate profits of the business. Now, don't forget how we measure the performance of a business is not through the cash flow, but from the P&L. So like it or not, we have to, I mean, any businesses managers have to sweat the assets, especially the current assets here or the net, uh, right? in order to generate uh, economic activities, to generate sales, to generate profits for the business. At the end of the day, it, all businesses are created for profits, isn't it? Now, but sometimes um, um, what a very uh, a plunge in working capital may not necessarily be uh, uh, um, you know, uh, bad as well. So you have to look at things in context. Yeah. Uh, uh, later on, I'll, I'll go through some examples. Uh, hopefully, it's easier for you to understand. Okay. But normally, um, when we read financial statements, uh, especially the annual reports, we focus a lot on how how the working capital uh, is being managed uh, in the business. Now, sometimes when the sales boom, right, or the company suddenly business enjoy a lot, have very high sales, right, uh, like your, com your, com your computer shop this year, naturally your working capital also increases. Why? Because you need to have more, you need to buy more inventory, you need to pay more, uh, you need to expand your, you know, your human resource capital, so on and so forth. So you need more working capital. All right. So not necessary that sometimes when you see a spike in work, working capital, it is a red flag. Not necessary. Okay. All right. So it depends on the nature of the business. Now, next, we're going to move on to what we, I call the CCC or cash conversion cycle. Now, cash conversion cycle um, is very important concept as well as metric because it tells you how long it takes for a business for example, to convert inventory or raw material to work in progress to fi uh, finish goods. Okay, then it also asks questions: How fast can the goods be sold, and how fast or how soon can the sales be translated to cash? And of course, it also tells us how fast or how how long do you want to direct the payment to the suppliers or the creditors. Right. Visually, it looks like this. Now, of course, a business, you have to buy raw materials. But don't, like, like any other transactions, when you, um, when a business uh, takes in raw materials, they, do, they not, may not necessarily have to pay on time or on the spot. They can also drag this uh, payment for these raw materials. But once the raw materials are in the warehouse or in the production uh, uh, factory, right? Then we can turn it into work in progress and finally to finish goods. Then the marketing team can sell it, right? Now, every time the finished goods is being sold, again, just like, the, just like you know, the raw materials, we may not necessarily um, receive cash right away. We may receive a portion of it. For example, your down payment, your prepayment, or you know, when you, you take a de the deposit or something, right? So you can take a portion first, then the balance you can actually uh, uh, book it as a receivables, which you receive sometime down the line. 
All right. Then when everything is being collected as cash, then you use this cash to pay your suppliers all right? or, or your creditors. Now, this may not necessarily happen in this linear fashion. Don't get me wrong. This is just a very simple uh, illustration. Things can happen anytime along the way. So if I put things in the context, right, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you still remember this. In fact, I showed this uh, uh, these uh, visuals uh, in the April uh, session. So look, let, let's look at this. So <clears throat> if you draw a line, all right, a horizontal line to, 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 uh, to show uh, in terms of timing, right, where all these activities come in, right? For example, where raw materials are purchased, all right, not in cash purchase, it could be purchased in uh, credit. Uh, the, then this, the, the, if we record this is day one, so you all, then you count the number of days when this inventory are being turned into a raw, uh, this inventory of raw material turned into work in progress, turned into finished goods. Okay, so this is the time. Then for finished goods, you have to sell, right? So now when you sell it, then of course this is when you get your cash. But don't forget, these raw materials when you when you purchase it into your business, you may not pay at this point, you may pay somewhere down the line, say you pay here. So this is when your payment is, is made, meaning your cash is going out of your company, of your business to buy this raw material. And then you ask, when do I collect the cash from the goods uh, sold, which is uh, which I uh, whereby I use these raw materials to produce. And it is here. Imagine you collected your payment here at this point. So any the difference between this point and this point is what we call the cash conversion cycle. It is the two points, it is the, the two points uh, where, uh, whereby um, it recorded the first cash outflow and as well as the cash inflow from that particular cell. All right, this is what we call the cash conversion cycle. Now, bear in mind that different in industries will have a different cash conversion cycle. That's why when you analyze this metric or analyze this parameter, it is best to analyze it as an industry. Uh, you cannot analyze the CCC of a furniture business against a fast uh, moving consumer good. You cannot analyze a CCC of a semiconductor business against a property business. It doesn't work that way. All right. Um, some businesses naturally, uh, by nature of their how fast the goods are being uh, uh, turned over, all right, they, they normally enjoy a very short uh, cash conversion cycle. Some companies, for example, properties, you take months, sometimes years to build property or construct property, right? So naturally, your cash conversion cycle will be very long, okay? So you need to look at things in context. I'll give you an example. Um, this is what we did, an exercise we did way before the pandemic. Uh. So uh, we, uh, once upon a time, uh, before the pandemic, we compared. Um, no, we're not saying which company is better than the other, but we are looking at the, we are using the cash conversion cycle as a yardstick to compare how efficient is the business in, 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 you know, in, 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 in generating the cash flow. So we compared the three glove companies between Top Glove, Harkonaika, and Kosan. So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to look at these numbers. Focus on the cash conversion cycle here. So for example, Kosan, uh, based on the late in 2018 or, or in the past average of the latest three years in this record here, they take about 100 days or slightly more than 100 days to come to you know to 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 uh to com, uh to convert their their inventory into uh cash from the sales so that's roughly about three months harder like on the other hand takes about 78 to 80 days which is again less than three months this is more than three months is less than three months on the other hand top glove takes 60 days which is about two months to convert the cash so in terms of ccc looks like top glove uh, is the was the most efficient uh, business here and why is that so you have to look at things in context i would say that actually uh, top golf is very good at collecting the uh, cash from the sales from the uh, which, which means that they are very uh, efficient to chase the, the receivables right as you can see here uh, their sales out outstanding is actually related to accounts receivable. So Top Glove collects the uh, has a shortest uh, day sales outstanding of forty four days. Uh, Hata Lega is almost the same, but longest is actually Kosan. All right. So this is how we look at things. Um, how we look at the cash flow 
um, uh, efficiency uh, in any business of the same industry uh, through the cash conversion cycle or through the uh, you know the details like uh, uh, accounts receivable days, uh, inventory days, or pay accounts payable days. Right. So these are some of the examples here. Now you can do this for the businesses that you invest in. Or when you say yeah, you like semiconductor companies, you like OSEC companies, for example, but which is the best, all right, or which you think has the best cash flow management, you can use this method to look at it. Okay. But remember, this is, should not be your only um, analog, um, a yardstick or your measurement parameter. It just gives you a view of the business in terms of efficiency. Okay. So I hope that's clear enough. All right, so let's look at the time now. It's okay, it's 9.20, so we've got plenty of time. Now let's move on. I guess next will be the case studies. Okay, great. Now, um, again, uh, whatever I shared is, is uh, quite theoretical, so uh, maybe a bit boring, but I'm trying to make it more interesting by uh, um, uh, sharing some of the more timely case studies that's happening around us right now. So for that, I need to look beyond KLSE now. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard about this company or at least read some of the headlines of China Evergrande, right? Now, China Evergrande, for information or for some background, it is the second largest property in, uh, uh, in China, all right? Uh, they are listed both in Shanghai as well as Hong Kong. Now, recently, the company uh, went into a lot of trouble because they cannot... Um, uh, uh, fulfill the financial obligations. So where is that in fine, uh, cash flow? Ah, okay, let's look at this. So which means that actually they cannot fulfill this part. Sorry about that. They cannot fulfill this part. Repayment of the debt, principal or even interest here. Repayment of interest is actually under OSCFR. Right? So this is repayment of debt. They cannot pay their bondholders. Wow, very bad. All right, when a company uh, is going to default on the bonds, it's actually a very bad sign. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen uh, some videos on social media of how some Chinese uncles and aunties are crying and how they are being stopped by the police, right? And, the, and as, as a result, the share price has tanked more than 80-90% in the past, uh, uh, since the peak in 2018. Uh, okay, so let me ask you, it, did, did this happen overnight or can it, somehow be preempted from the uh, financial statements. Again, a lot, when, again, uh, uh, I want to highlight to you the, the dangers if you only focus on p &L. Now, if you look at here, uh, hopefully, let me zoom in for you guys. If you look at the p &L only, right, you can see that, oh, since 2004, Chinese Evergrande, it is in uh, renminbi, uh, they grew from 1.4 uh, billion renminbi to 500 million, sorry, 500 billion renminbi in 15 years. Wow. In terms of performance, in this business performance, absolutely, they're growing 500 times. All right. They're growing absolutely in huge growth. In terms of profits, do they make profits from 78, 79 uh, 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 billion ringgit, sorry, million ringgit in 2004 to 31 billion ringgit? Wow. There's a huge jump in profits as well, right? So if you just look at the PL, you think that, oh, this company is growing. It's a great company, isn't it? But if you look at the cash flow, let's not look at the debt first, just look at the cash flow. Are these profits backed by real cash transaction for operating activities, which is OSCF here? Look at it. Look at these few, few, uh, few years here. Yes, the revenue grew every year. Profits grew every year, but look at the cash flow from operating activity. It's red, which means that in terms of the cash flow transaction from operating activities, the company is actually bleeding cash. Why? Because they are perhaps, you know, their expenses are more than their sales. All right, you can see here. Now, then you may be asking, hey, can business, how can the business tahan so long? Huh? Having a bleeding cash year in, year out for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years can by raising money from financing activities you see they can you see for for how many years their, their financing activities is positive then they have been raising money from the uh, uh borrowing money from the bank from the shareholders through if they even become their own bank um, to uh, underwrite certain financial products to raise money all right then you may be asking is this sustainable 
you know, when, yeah, one year, oh, suddenly 2018, they have positive transact, uh, open cash flow, 2020 positive, but you have to look at things in, 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 in totality, look at long-term, right? Now, of course, I do not discount that after this, they could turn around. But again, uh, one swallow does not uh, make a spring, right? You have to look at this, see whether they can sustain or they can repeat this uh, performance here, okay? Now, and, and, and as I mentioned, the, I also mentioned about free cash flow, isn't it? So free cash flow is operating activities, uh, you sum it up with investing. And because both are negative, you can see that actually, this company has been bleeding cash for the past many years. Now, if you sum things up, you can see that for the past 15 years, uh, between 2004 to 2020, no, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years, pardon me. For the past 17 years, this company has bled out 16 uh, sorry, 615 billion renminbi bled out. At the same time, they have also borrowed 774 billion renminbi. Think about it. Just use a logical, you don't even need to be a businessman, right? In the past 17 years, they borrowed in total 774 billion. At the same time, they bled out. So where, all, where did all this money go, right? Yeah, you're scratching your head, right? But this is actually a premonition. It's a sign that something is not right in this company. So if you ask me truthfully, if this, uh, is this news come, it came as a, uh, is this new a surprise? Not, not in fact, uh, we've been talking to some of our uh, fund manager associates in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, right? They say actually, if you are a value investor, right, actually you would have you would have uh, sold off any any re, uh, products or financial products related to Edward Grande since uh, one or uh, one and a half years ago already. All right, and then before this uh, boom, I mean before all, all these things crash, then you may ask, hey David, this is a property company, right? So isn't it normal for a company? Look look at their cash conversion cycle, a thousand days. Now what is a thousand days? I uh, have you think about have a thought about it. Based on the 2000, let's okay, let's let's say it maybe 2019 is a special year, lah. Huh? But you look at the average for the past five years, it's about a thousand nine hundred at best, you know, eight hundred seventy one in twenty twenty. What is the meaning of eight hundred days or nine hundred days, right? One year, how many days are there? Three hundred sixty five. So it means that the cash conversion cycle. Huh? So let me let me remind you what is cash conversion cycle. Huh? Is from this point. Sorry. From this point to this point, uh, this sorry, this point to this point, uh, it takes three years <laughs> to collect your money, right? So you ask, is this a good business? Well, you say maybe it's typical, you know. Sorry, not this typical for a property company. So let's let's not be so biased. Let's let's look at another company, uh, also a property, but not listed in uh, not in China. They're domiciled in Hong Kong. Uh, they are one of the, I think they are the biggest uh, properties, uh, uh, real estate company in Hong Kong. All right. I can see here, yeah, they are also growing, but not as, not at a crazy rate, like what uh, Evergrande enjoy, right? In, in that similar period about, this is about 15, uh, 16 years. Okay. Uh, they are profitable. But let's look at their cash flow for operating activities, especially in the past one, two, three, four, five, six years. You can see very clearly, very clearly, right? Actually, this business in the past one, two, three, four, five, six, they are actually very healthy. Why? Because they are generating a, a, a positive operating cash flow. Then, of course, you can look at the debt. Yeah. Uh, later on, you can look at the Evergrande debt. Uh, huh? it's, it's actually the net debt is much higher than their uh, uh, total equity. Uh, sorry, your shareholders equity. Here at least for Sohong Kai, you know, they are, uh, um, um, they, are, they are actually very, very strong in terms of the balance sheet. Now let's come back to the free cash flow. The free cash flow, yes, is quite lumpy, but at least if you look at things in totality, this business is doing very well. Now just, uh, um, sorry, uh, if you sum it all together, right, I think you get a positive, uh, we get a number which is much bigger than this. I'm sorry, I forgot to add this, so I don't have the numbers here. All right, um, um, and then I want to sh show you here, uh, which is the stark difference between uh, this uh, Sun Hong Kai as well, uh, Sing Hong Kai as well as this uh, Evergrande, right? 
In terms of the financing activities cash flow, you can see that for some years, they are actually having a negative financing activity. So what does this mean? It means that they are actually paying them in net net, they are paying out more loans, uh, more debt, at least the principal than they are uh, borrowing. So this is a good sign for a property company because it shows that they are generating enough cash flow for them to repay their debts, to, uh, to repay it. To, to fulfill the financial obligation. And that's why you can have a positive uh, net cash at the end of the uh, uh, year or financial period. As you can see here, the cash conversion cycle is even longer <laughs> than China. So what does this mean? It means actually, uh, in comparison, uh, it is, takes much faster to build and sell a, a property in China compared to Hong Kong. So that's what it means. Okay, now, then you ask, so I gave you a two examples of uh, a very uh, poorly managed, in terms of cash flow, a very poorly managed business against a normal or a well-run company. How about Malaysia? But this, uh, how, in the context of Malaysia, do we have such companies? I can tell there are plenty. All right. Now, case in point, there's one company which ran into trouble. Uh, it was categorized as PN17 back in 2019. Okay. Now I like to talk about case studies, his, historical case studies, at least, you know, don't get into trouble because all these are published already. Ma. It doesn't mean that I'm trying to smear a company. But of course, that time, this company was actually went, going through a rough patch mm, internally as well as, as, as a, a business, right? So uh, some shareholders, you know, if, if, if you remember, if you have followed or at least invested in this company before, you would have remembered uh, a lot of drama lah, in the AGM where a lot of uh, shareholders suddenly... Uh, who amass a lot of shares, they are nominating their own uh, directors to kick out the, uh, the, the, the uh, existing board of directors, so on and so forth. Okay, now again, things like this can be preempted. Now, on, uh, for background, Cicera uh, is a Tao company. So, Tao company, you don't expect the cash conversion cycle to be very short, isn't it? Now, let's look at the, uh, um, these are some of their financial figures. If you look at the revenues, is this a growing company? Quite obvious it's not. In fact, sales are dwindling, right? Uh, in the past, in this period, okay? Uh, they are, um, they are, are they profitable? They are profitable. <laughs> Interestingly, they are profitable. Before 2018, I can see they are profitable. And you look at the cash flow, it's very lumpy, all right? Uh, especially some years, that's... It is negative, but let's look at things in context. Uh. To me, for example, 2020, 20, uh, 2012, 2013, 2014 are actually very bad years. Why? Because you see, 2012, the revenue is 30 mil, 38 million uh, revenue, but they have a net cash flow from operating avis of 72 million, double of the revenue. By the way, double of the revenue. What's going on? You may be asking, right? Okay, so this is what's happening, right? Then in terms of their uh, um, fin uh, financing, they have been heavily borrowing, at, especially in the uh, uh, last three years of 2016, 2018. Uh, why? Because you see in, in uh, the free cash flow is, is very, very negative here. Why? Because their operating activities cash flow is, is, is um, uh, very bad. Uh, they cannot generate uh, cash from the sales. And most importantly, they have been borrowing heavily in these three years as well. Okay, so imagine if they have failed to secure funding here, the business would have gone under much, much uh, earlier already. Okay, now, uh, then you look at the average cash conversion cycle. This to me is a telltale sign of, uh, of this company uh, going uh, heading into trouble at that time. Um, you see, the cash conversion cycle jumped from three months to one year to two years to three years in a span of one, two, three, four, five years. This is actually a very big red flag already. If you see numbers like this, right? Actually, to me, the top line, the PL is a bit meaningless already because this shows you either there is a huge change in the business model or they may suddenly uh, switch from a Tao company to you know, property development. I don't know, but it didn't happen. So they are still in Tao's business. This showed me that actually something is very wrong already. So which means that actually the, all these numbers here, this cash, I mean, this P&L, right? To me, I would I would study it, uh, analyze it with a very big pinch of salt. Uh, okay. 
And that is why it came to no surprise that in 2019, this company went into a lot of trouble, right? So they, I think they almost become insolvent. Uh, I think their debt has, uh, 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 so, I mean, they have amassed too much debt uh, that I think the creditors are going after them. That, that's why they went into PN17 status. Okay. Now I'm showing this uh, case to you. It's not to belittle. In fact, I think this company is still around. I think uh, the new management is trying to turn around the business. Okay. It's to show you actually sometimes uh, a lot of things can be, can be hidden. All right. Or not, I would say not hidden, but can, a lot of things cannot be ascertained. Uh, from the PL or even sometimes the balance sheet or even sometimes the cash flow. So we need to look at the cash, uh, working capital management and sometimes, uh, and a lot of times, a lot, you can derive a lot of clues uh, at looking at how uh, a company manages it, uh, cash flow uh, uh, for running the business. Okay. So hopefully I've shown you enough bad examples already. Okay, now let's look at a good example. And that's why I'll talk about Nestle. Nestle is always a company that I, I would like to use as case study to show, to, to, to underscore how a business should run. Okay, now although it's very boring, <laughs> share price in terms of absolute figure is very high. All right, but this is an absolutely wonderful company. By the way, uh, disclaimer, I'm a shareholder. I'm a long-term shareholder of Nestle, right? Um, so, you, and, 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 so there you go. Now, in terms of revenue, is this company growing in the past 16 years? In 2004, they booked a sales of 2.9 billion ringgit. In 2020, it's 5.4. Yeah, they are growing. Yeah, not as it's not high growth. They are actually almost double up in, in uh, 16 years. So it's not very high growth, but at least they are growing. Are they profitable? Yes, definitely. All right. Their, their profit also grew almost in tandem with their sales. But let's look at their cash flows. Just take a couple of seconds here. Look at their cash flow. All right. The cash flow from operating activities uh, jumped almost three times. All right. From uh, 376 million to 900 million. In fact, in 2018, they peaked at 1 billion. All right. Uh, are they investing every year? Definitely, they're investing uh, very healthily every single year because it's net outflow, negative. Financing, oh, how come every year negative? Yeah, is this a bad sign? Is this a red flag? Now, that's why you have to look at things in context, okay? Now, if I sum this up, right, and let's compare this with the Evergrande example, although there are two different industries, right? But I want you to look at how uh, a well-run business manages their cash flow. Now, Nasdaq is a business that over the past 16 years amassed 8.4 billion free cash flow, where along that same period, they paid up 8.5 billion as well through financing activities. They may be asking, hey, what's going on? Can I say that whatever free cash flow that they generate, from their operating activities, net of whatever they need to grow the business through KPEX. They pay off everything through financing, true. But again, as I mentioned, financing, there are many elements, right? Not just, print, not just that, there is also something called the distribution of cash dividends. Now you may be asking, hey, how do I know that most of this money is actually distributed as cash back to the shareholders? You look at the dividends paid, not the absolute figure, but the payout ratio. Look at this. Now, just look at this. Now, I, I zoom in for you guys to see. What can you tell me about Nestle's history of dividend payout from 2004 all the way to 2020? Okay, especially for the last 10 years, what do you see? Or last five years? It is close to 100% or even higher than 100% uh, for some years. What does that mean? It means that whatever profit they make here, net income to the company, they pay out as dividends most of the time. Then you may be asking, hey, something is not right, isn't it? Don't the company need money to retain some profits in the business, to grow the business? Yes, they do. In fact, they definitely do, but they do not use their own money to grow. They use other people's money. Why? Look at their working capital management. Look at their cash conversion cycle, especially in this part here. I zoom in for you guys to see. All right. This line highlighted in pink is their cash conversion cycle. Really? 
something not right. This is negative. How can cash conversion cycle be negative? <laughs> is it possible? It is absolutely possible. Let me show you. Going back to this uh, uh, picture again. All right. In Nestle case, it's Nestle's case, right? Okay, let me just highlight here, uh, uh, zoom in here for you guys to see. When we have a normal case like this, a scenario like this, the cash conversion cycle is a positive number of days. When it is negative, what has got to happen, right? When it is negative, it means that the payment made here from the accounts payable is actually happening after the payment is received from the good soul, <laughs> all right? In other words, Nestle has been using other people's money, either the bank's financing or their suppliers' uh, 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 working capital to finance their oper operations every single year. <laughs> yeah, you can see how, of course, you may be saying, hey, this is not a very ethical way of running business, right? Well, it depends on which angle you're looking at. Now, Nestle, although they have a longer payment period, uh, for the suppliers, but what they can guarantee is they will always pay out. When the time when the time comes to pay, they will always pay out, and that is much better. Is if I'm a supplier to my client, I would rather have that surety, that a guarantee that my client will pay me, other than every time I ask for payment, the client will drag me uh, for days and months or even years to come. I would prefer that. Um, at least there's a guarantee, at least it's consistent so that I can plan my own working capital management for my own business, okay? So that is um, you know, one way of looking at it. Uh, it is a very unique way we look at this. Uh, uh, of course, there are other metrics as well are like uh, because of the efficiency that margins have increased and so forth. There's so many ways to look at this, but tonight um, I just want to uh, highlight the importance of cash flow. Um, there are, again, just to recap, there are three cash flow statements uh, which are operating activities cash flow, investing activities cash flow, and financing activities cash flow. And the free cash flow is derived uh, by adding the operating, uh, operating activities uh, with the investing activities cash flow. All right. And we also talk about the working capital management where we, we highlight what are the components to make up your working capital, as well as a concept of uh, cash conversion cycle. Okay. So with that, uh, I know it's not very sexy compared to the other tech stocks, but it's important that you know this, uh, at least when you analyze your business, uh, your, your investment that you hold, or even, you know, analyzing your own uh, spending habits or right, in real life, right? Actually, this is very important as well. Okay, Shane, um, I guess this is the end of my presentation. So and back to you. All right. Thank you so much, David, for doing this session in a very detailed format. I think uh, many of us here have find this very useful. So you have find this very useful, right? Could you give us a 10? Uh, you write one zero, okay? In this session, <laughs> you find that this is a 10 session, okay? Wow. I think today uh, a lot of us here have understood cash flow so much better right now, okay? Thank you. So uh, if you have any question to ask David, in, you may write in the Q&A segment where we will pick your questions to ask, but due to overwhelming response, we may not be able to address every question. So, but one question that I noticed that many people ask is that, uh, David, where can we find the average cash conversion cycle? Ah, uh, um, okay. If, if you... If you rely on quarterly reports or the um, annual report from the company that you download from Bursa Malaysia, right? Unfortunately, you have to calculate on your own. Um, but there are actually some databases like Bursa Marketplace. Um, uh, they, they, they do uh, uh, publish the cash flow from operating activities plus, uh, um, sorry, the, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, they, they do publish these figures like uh, accounts. Some of them, they don't call it DSO. Uh, they just also they call it accounts receivable days. Uh, these are accounts payable days and, and uh, inventory days, right? All right. So you can actually uh, use this. You use this formula. Again, it's very simple. You take, um, uh, where is it? Where's the case studies? Eh? No, yeah. All right. Now you use this figure. You use this. 
a very simple graphic to calculate. Then you can you can find out the answer already. Um, for me, I I, I subscribe to a few uh, database provider. Uh, for international market, I focus on two. One is Guru Focus as well as uh, TIKR.com. You can go and look at it. Uh, of course, if you think that you're not ready to pay for this subscription, right, you can refer to your broker or to Busa uh, Marketplace. I'm sure you can find some uh, the data there, but just that you may have to do some post-processing. You may have to do your own calculation. Okay, Shane? Okay. Oh, in the financial statement, where does it appear? Is it? Uh, it appears in the balance sheet. All this, uh, uh, um, you have to convert it. There is a formula to convert the figure to days inventory and days receivable. There is a figure. So tonight, uh, because I don't to dive into um, the mathematics, I just want to talk. I look at the application. If we dive into mathematics, I think a lot of people will get bored. <laughs> So um, Vivian asked how to calculate average conversion cycle if you didn't subscribe. Okay, it's very simple from here. Now, the cash conversion cycle is the difference between your days receivable here plus your days inventory minus your days payable. Okay, so again, days inventory plus your days receivable take away minus your days payable. Okay, now how you calculate the days payable, days inventory and days receivable, right? Um, I think days inventory is you take your inventory, your total inventory divided by the sales, multiplied by 365. Days receivable is you take your accounts receivable divided by sales, multiplied by 365. I think days payable is you take your accounts payable divided by something else already and multiply by 300. I can't remember the formula now. Right. Uh, as I think it's very obvious to you, right? I don't calculate. Actually, I just refer to the to uh the data that I subscribe to. It's easier to tell the truth. I don't really have time to calculate. Yeah, I re I rather uh pay some money for somebody to generate the the figures and then I'll just analyze it. Mm. Uh, okay. I'm sure you, you just Google. It's it's very easy to find. Just uh just Google. Uh, days payable formula or cash coverage cycle formula. There are a lot of resources out there. Okay. So the uh, next question is asked by Ang Beng Kwan. How do you differentiate between operating cash flows and funds from operating activities? I don't quite get the answer. What is the meaning of funds mm. from operating activities? Maybe Beng Kwan, you clarify for a bit mm, then mm. we take the question after that after yeah yeah verifies, mm. okay so uh fahuruzi uh, would like to ask which one is more important is it net cash from operating activities or operating cash flow before working capital changes okay um normally when i read the financial statements i read it from top to the bottom uh. So in context to your question, I will first look at the uh, 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 net cash before working capital changes because I want to see whether sometimes is, is there a huge depreciation charge or is there any unusual items. Then I will look at the working capital changes. Then I will need to see is the changes in working capital in tandem with the growth or the P&L. Now, let me give you an example. As I mentioned earlier on, if there is a spike in working capital, all right, uh, so what is working capital again? Uh, just referring to this, these are some of the examples of working capital. If there's a spike in working capital, then I will go and look back at their PL. Has the PL grow as well? Has the sales grow? And in fact, not just like that, I want to look at the, 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 the magnitude of the growth. Let me give you an example. If the sales grow by 100 million and the receivables grow by say 50 million or 60 million or even 100 million, I'll say, okay, it's quite normal. All right, but of course, I will need to look at the next reporting period. I want to see how fast the business can collect the cash. But I give you an example. If the business book a sales growth, additional sales 100 million, but the receivables went up by 200 million. Oh, I mean, of course, I'm just being a bit extreme. Lah. That to me is a red flag. 
Okay, so I analyze it like this in, in this way so that I look at this in context, right? And then at the end of the day, it is the net cash that is uh, quite, uh, 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 from these three financial statements that will tell me how, how it will affect the balance sheet at the end of the day. So to answer your questions, I, first I look at the uh, um, net cash before working capital changes. Then I look at the working capital changes and what causes the changes or is it, uh, and then I analyze it in uh, with reference to the PL. Then I look at the net cash from operating activities. Mm. Sometimes uh, maybe I can explain a little bit more. Let me give you an example of, uh, I'm sure you guys know Padini, right? Right? Now Padini, um, a lot of people think that Padini manufactures their own products, their own shirts, you know, their own uh, apparel. Actually, they don't. Uh, their inventory is consists of raw materials. They buy the raw material, they buy the cotton, they buy the yarn. Then they don't manufacture it. They actually uh, uh, hire, they actually outsource the manufacturing in China. All right, they, make, they get somebody to make the clothes for them. Then they, uh, they ship it from the supplier, for, for, the, for the contractor and sell it. Okay, now one year, uh, because it, you know, but they need is a cash business, and you know they are they are they 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 sub, I mean they cater to the mass market, so naturally you expect this company to have very strong cash flow management, right? Especially uh, operating if it's cash flow positive. Now one year, one year suddenly there was a dive in operating activities cash flow. Okay, um. Chunxian, can I use TK, TIKR to maybe answer sure. this question? Can I? Go, right. go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So where is it? Can, can, uh, are you still seeing my screen? Yes, we are still seeing your screen. So you see this uh, TIKR term, terminal, right? No, no. We are seeing your slide. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So let me unshare. Let me share this screen. Okay, so this is the uh, one, one of the financial data that I use, all right? Uh, so I type Padini Holdings, uh, okay. Now, what, why I say this, why I bring it up to show you sometimes you have to look at things in context, not just analyzing the numbers, okay? As you can see here in terms of cash flow, right? Look at, uh, maybe I drag a little bit more. I don't know when it happened already. Da, da, da. Okay, uh, maybe I do here. All right, and then I do free cash flow. Oh, yeah, don't have free cash flow here. Okay, never mind. Uh, let's look at investing activities. All right, let's see. Ah, okay, here. Now, look at, uh, I think, it, I'm not sure if it, it was this year, but if you look at 2014, right, you can see that there is suddenly a very the, the, the cash flow for operating ABG, which is denoted in blue color, it just tanked, it dropped a lot. And at the same time, the cash flow for investing activities increased a lot. So here, what happened was naturally, um, tr traditionally, it is a positive, it will generate positive cash flow, but for this year, it was a negative free cash flow. So as an investor, it actually alerted us is this a possible red flag? Then we go and we go and dive into the accounts. Then we found out, oh, actually it's not. Why? It's because they bought a lot of raw material at that year because the management anticipate that the price of cotton is going to skyrocket, probably due to weather conditions or some supply issue. That they took the preemptive measure to uh, buy more uh, inventory. Now you see what happened is. When you use a lot of cash, uh, because it basically it's just converting cash into inventory, right? You increase your working capital, then your uh, uh, operating business capital came down. Then you ask, okay, is whatever doing, uh, is it detrimental to business or is the management taking preemptive step to secure the raw materials before the price goes up so that next year they can enjoy, they can be profitable again? Right, so of course after that we found hey, actually it's, it's not it's, 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 uh, it makes business sense that's why to us that particular year we just consider it as a fluke now of course uh, as you can see here after that it, it normalizes and to, in fact the cash flow went back uh, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the normal trajectory here so there is one particular instance um, um, whereby we need to analyze things in context not, not, not that every time you see a, 
uh, operating cash flow uh, 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 becoming negative or reducing in drastically is a, it is it is a confirm a red flag not necessarily so i hope i answered the question in uh, as well as giving by by giving this example uh, chun sian yeah um actually bing kwan also clarified that funds from operating activities is before working capital changes Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so, which some equity analysts uh, use it rather than net operating cash flow. Okay. Yeah. Again, I think it was the same uh, ans- question that I answered before, right? Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, you have to look at things. You have to analyze it. Uh, uh step uh, from the top to the to the bottom, right? From because cash flow, how you get cash flow for operating activities, you need to get it from the net income first or the earnings or the net profit. Then you take away all the adjustments of the non-cash items. Then you uh, 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 add in the working capital changes. Then you get the net operating cash flow. Now, of course, this is a bit technical. Um, that is not my intention tonight to go through the work on mathematics. Uh, in fact, I would rather do uh, analyze the application of the cash flow. Yeah. Okay. This question is a bit more deep and technical i'm not sure if you're familiar <laughs> with it? not sure if you're familiar with the indicators or not could you explain the difference between free cash flow to firm and free cash flow to equity wow. <laughs> which do you find more important uh? <laughs> free cash flow to firm and free cash flow to equity this is by leon jay wow this yeah sorry uh, i'm not uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I don't really analyze this. I used to do look at this, especially the owner's earnings. Um, in fact, I even I even read the book by uh, Robert something on on this subject two times. I still really cannot get the 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 uh, the concept. But never mind. I know Leon. This is a question by Leon Jake Lim, right? Yeah, that's right. Let me get back to Leon uh, personally because I I. I'm very sorry. I have to apologize. I do not how, know how to answer this question tonight. <laughs> yeah, I also find this a bit technical. Never mind. Uh, hold on. Let me copy. Let me copy first. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. Done. Yeah. Done. All right. So next question is by, uh, Tionghua. For banking and insurance, banking and insurance. Mm. What would be the key measure since we cannot refer to cash flow and CCC? Ah, oh, wow. That's to answer that question. question. <laughs> to answer that question, you may take a few, you may take a, 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 a cost. All right. For, for banking and the, actually the, there are other financial metrics to look at. Uh, one of them will be the net, uh, earn, uh, the net, uh, net, what, net margin. All right. The other, no, no, I forgot what is it again. Obviously, I'm not a I'm not investor in banks. Uh, any, all right. Um, the what's the ratio again? Uh? NIM net net interest. Uh, net interest margin. Yes, thank you. And the other one would be the um. There's a term the non-performing loans. loans. Yes. Gross yeah. impact. Yes, Do impairments. Gross impairments. Impact. Uh, those who uh normally for banks. I guess you're asking in terms of the red flag, right? So uh, those will be the things that I look at in terms of uh, for, for, for banks. For insurance, wow, that is another, again, another topic. Um, there are so many other metric insurance, uh, conversion, uh, this uh, management expense ratio, so on and so forth, which may not necessarily be able, you're not, you're not able to derive uh, uh, directly from the cash flow statement. Yeah. So to be honest, uh, I personally do not invest in banks, not because they are not good, <laughs> but because I really don't know how to analyze it. All right, that's one. Uh, for insurance, I only invest in one insurance company, and that is Tune Protect. Uh, by the way, uh, this is not a stock pick, right? And the reason why I invested in Tune Protect since early days is because it is I invest in Tune Protect, not because not not just for the uh, insurance business, but as a proxy to AHS growth. Yeah. So um, I don't really look at the numbers in such a detail. Lah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Actually, mm. insurance is really tough. The balance sheet is very tough. Balance, very tough. In fact, why- I, 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 take, I give you a very funny thing. Lah. Many years ago, I know a banker because he used to be, he used to attend the same investing course as I did. <laughs> I forgot his name, lah, by the way. But anyway, I asked him, hey, because he, he is a VP, you know, quite high. Uh. I forgot what was his, 
uh, expertise already then, but it's related to commercial banking. Uh. I asked him, hey, since you're in the bank for many years, right, do we invest in banking stocks? You know what was his answer? No way. <laughs> he said, because it's too complex to analyze the balance sheet as well as the cash flow. That's why he, doesn't, he didn't invest in it. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that banking stocks are absolutely no, no, no for investment. In fact, banking stocks are a crucial component of the KLCI. So if you, are, if you have the skills as well as the background uh, and knowledge to analyze it, by all means, maybe you can teach me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. For banking stock, the operation cash flow is also vastly different. <laughs> yes, it's very different. No, negative could, uh, is, is actually a good sign. Yeah, because yeah. banks make money from Lo- lending, lending money. money. Yeah, mm. okay. Okay, so let's pick uh, one last question. Uh. Let me see. So David, if the company cash flow is positive, yep. sorry, hmm? let, me, let me rephrase. Huh? So if the company profit is increasing, but cash flow is negative occasionally, like, would you invest in this? Or would you hold this company? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that? If, if the operating cash flow is positive? No, if the, let's say like, if the profit is increasing, okay. profit is increasing, but uh, operating cash flow is not doing so nice, okay? Sometimes policies are negative, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So how would you... Lumpy, is lumpy. Yeah. Mm. Would I invest in it? Yeah, what would be appropriate action? Would you call <laughs> or would you... Uh, I think this participant is referring to one particular business, right? <laughs> well... Um, oh, in gas company, is it? <laughs> um, I mentioned... Please don't analyze cash flow in silo. Now, cash flow can be lumpy, especially cash flow for operating activities. And absolutely, cash, uh, free cash flow is always very lumpy one. You cannot... Of course, there are some companies that, that will have very strong cash flow uh, record. And, and these are exemplary companies. Case in point, the glove makers have all this... I uh, mean... I mean, despite the, the negative uh, um, sentiment from this post-COVID thing, right, crash, right? Actually, as a business, uh, most of the glove companies, a lot, especially the big three or big four, uh, they are actually very well run. Their cash flow mention is very solid, all right? Uh, semiconductor companies are very solid as well, especially the big boys uh, like MPI, Unisem, you know, uh, Inari, all these uh, uh, names that we uh, that I always uh, uh, quote in my sessions. Uh. But not all businesses are like that. And it is just part and parcel of running business, especially if you are manufacturing or you are trading, uh, if your business is trading in nature, right? Sometimes, um, or which is which means that your business is very susceptible to the cycle, to the business cycle, right? Sometimes you get very lumpy cash flow. Uh, again, you have to look at things in context. I have to stress, I cannot stress it now, that you have to analyze the financial statement as a whole. Don't just look at um, cash flow statements as a as a as a statement on its own. You have to like you have to read the three statements as one single statement. Okay, um, uh, you have mm. to read it because all of these are interrelated to each other. Now, I'm I'm not the right person to talk about this. In fact, uh, and uh, uh, I have a team member who has a finance background, accounting background, and he teaches this uh, in one of our basic courses called FSACC, la, Financial Statement Analysis Crash Course. All right. For me, I would rather use it to and uh, mean to apply to see whether there are any red flags that I need to be uh, careful about. Now, don't forget, cash flow is a heartbeat, but it does not measure the performance. Normally, stock price goes up and down, uh, because of the how well or how poorly the business perform, not from the cash flow. I would like to stress this the stock price or the stock valuation is more sensitive to the performance of the P&L, but not the cash flow. But if you want to analyze truly how well the business is run, deep dive, right? We have to look at the cash flow in context to the P&L. Yeah. So 
Um, just now I talked about Padimi. So I hope that the, uh, uh, the person who asked this question, please look into the details of the operating activities cash flow. What made it negative when it is uh, you know, in a down year? Or in fact, even on positive year, what made it positive? Is it because of the working capital changes or is it because really the company is growing? Yeah. Mm, okay, I think since we still have many people here online, let's do one last question. Yeah, yeah? no problem. As a bonus. Okay, thank mm. you, David. So, uh, from a point of view, do you think that a company with uh, cash rich, zero debt, good to invest in a long term in terms uh -huh. of business expansion? Uh, <laughs> this question is actually very tricky because many years ago, when I'm 100% quantitative investor, meaning I analyze the numbers, you know, like really uh, deep dive into the numbers, right? I forget about the business, you know, I don't care about the business. I don't care about the business model. I don't care about the qualitative. I just look at the numbers. Then I found out that actually some businesses, they are look great in these numbers, but they have no growth. Uh, business is in the Red Sea. So in the end, it became a value trap, which means what? Yes, you look, you invest in a company with net cash, right? No debt. Profitable, but no growth. Again, that's why I say you have to look at things in context, right? So, so what may happen is that, yeah, you buy thinking that you have bought into a damn value business, of a great stock, right? But you may end up holding the stock or the business for a un, you know, for a long period of time that you get fed up. Say, I, yeah, I should have use this money to invest in other companies, right? So that's why I say you have to look at things in context. Um, don't just look at cash flow. Don't look at, don't use cash flow as your only yardstick. You have to study the cash flow in context with the PL as well as the balance sheet in terms of uh, for their financial health, right? So to answer the, the, that, that uh, participant's questions, I will look at the growth as well. Now, I, let's assume that this business is net cash, no debt. Um, profit and loss is actually uh, growing healthily. All right. Then I would, rec I would uh, maybe suggest to the participant to study, to look at what type of business this is. Is it a, is it a business that is in high demand? Is it a high growth sector? Uh, as well as look at the management. Now, if all this take right, uh, and to me, why not, right? It, it's actually, when it all takes, it means that actually you found a good company. Now, I would love to find a company uh, at a fair price, meaning I'll invest it, but I would love it even more if the market gives me a discount. <laughs> meaning, for example, uh, whatever happens could be US raising interest rates, could be there's a, you know, a inflationary uh, uh, fears, so on and so forth. Federal Reserve, uh, you know, um, um, tapering down all these will create a lot of uh, havoc in the market right and if the share price or the vision does come down then you say hey I've done I've done my analysis this is a great company they have great cash flow management the balance sheet is very strong good management good business I will invest yes yeah so that is how we look at things how we connect the dots all right thank you so much David for doing this cash flow session so yeah. uh, I hope um, that I, I apologize if I cannot answer all the questions as you know I'm an engineer background this is not my forte but I hope to get, give you at least at least from the layman's point of view for a non-financial investor lah, <laughs> that at least you can look at things in in, uh, in, uh, in in this manner yeah Shane thank you all right so thank you so much David uh, let me tell you more about our next session yeah okay so thank you David Okay, for our next session, the topic is on using Elliott Wave, identifying price movement patterns in trading. So this session will take place on next Wednesday, that is the 13th of October, 2021, 8.30 to 10 p.m. So I've just given you the registration link in, uh, in the chat box. So you may go there and register yourself if you want to learn about this technical uh, technical theory and indicator, which is Elliott Wave Theory. Okay, how to use Elliott Wave Theory to spot uh, trading opportunities. So that's happening on 13th of October, next Wednesday. So uh, 
All in all, we want to thank, express our gratitude to David for doing this very in-depth analysis into understand cash flow statement. So I think now we all learn why cash flow statement is a heartbeat of every business. So thank you, uh, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, every one of you who uh, joined this session. So if you want to catch David, David have another session happening, uh, another upcoming uh, Wednesday. So remember mm. to watch our uh, upcoming emails. All right, so okay. where you can register for the David session. So Good see night, you everyone. all next Wednesday. Bye. Okay, Have a pleasant weekend.